afternoon, everybody. We've got folks joining us from all across the continent today, and I wanted to welcome you to another really exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast. My name is Jesse, and if you are new to our programs, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classes around the world through like a gazillion free live interactive broadcast every single month. You can check us all out at exploringbytheseat.com. Now, today's program is not just a normal program. Today's program is very special because we are continuing on our epic cross Canada road trip in conjunction with the amazing teams at Parks Canada and Canadian Geographic Education. We have been out east to Nova Scotia. We've learned about archaeology there. We just wrapped up earlier today with turtles in Ontario. We've been up to Inuvik in the Northwest Territories to talk about amazing birds of prey. And for today's program, I'll announce in just a minute what we are getting the chance to learn about. One last note before we get underway. I wanted to note that there is a contest associated with this series this year. So the folks at Canadian Geographic have an amazing program where if you finish today's program and you want to draw what you learned about or talk about what you learned about, just share in general your passion for what we had the chance to discover today, you are entered into a contest for a chance to win some really fantastic prizes. So I hope our classes take the chance to check that out at the end and I'll make sure you all have that link if you registered for today. So for today, we are going to, even by Canada standards, a pretty spectacular spot. We are going live just inside of Kluwani National Park in the Yukon. Now, this is one of the most special regions, not just in Canada, but the entire world. And why are we there? We are there to explore the case of the missing salmon. Kokanee salmon breed in the park, and we're going to learn a little bit about some of the, the biology, the history, some of the cool stuff going on there, and have the chance to have a fantastic cultural experience as well with a special guest. So, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Rochelle, live from the park. Thank you so much for joining us today, and take us Hello. away. Hello. Hello. So nice to see everybody. Hang on, let me make sure everything's good. So everyone can hear us all right? We can hear you. Yes. Oh, you are good to go. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, hello, bonjour. Uh, my name is Rochelle, and I'm coming to you from here in Kluwani National Park and Reserve on the traditional territories of Champagne and Ajac First Nations and Kluwani First Nation. I'm so, 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 so lucky uh, to live and work in such an incredible place with some equally incredible people. And I'm really excited to have this chance to share a part of the Kluwani story with all of you all across North America today. Uh, before we start, I'd like to introduce Champion and Ajax First Nations Chief, Chief Smith. So go ahead. I am a member of the uh, Wolf Mori of the Southern Deshawnee people. I am a uh, also a member of the Dakluwadi clan um, from the Klingit Nation. So uh, just like to welcome everybody uh, to the broadcast and hopefully you'll learn a little something of our uh, wonderful country. Thank you so much. All right, so we're gonna get started today and we are talking about kokanee salmon. So our salmon team here, salmon team, excuse me, here in Kluwani is made up of land guardians from Champion and Asia First Nations, researchers from Parks Canada, and a handful of climate scientists. So together, all of us are working on monitoring the kokanee salmon and we've been doing so for 40 years. Why are we spending so much time on these salmon though? What do you think? It's Something is really mysterious is happening with their population. And frankly, we all really love to try and solve a good mystery. So that's why everyone here is working on it. And on the slides, you should see some photos of our team out at Sockeye Lake doing that research. So do you see the graph on this slide? Usually graphs are kind of boring, but this one's a good one. So this graph is a hint at what the mystery is that we're trying to solve. So the bottom horizontal line, everyone put your arm like this. All right, so that line is the year, and the vertical line is the number of kokanee salmon our salmon team counted that year. Can everyone point to which part of the graph they think is the mysterious part? Everyone pointing? Okay. So did you point to the spot between 2010, or sorry, 2000 and 2010, where the black dots are all at the bottom and close together? Yeah? That's right. So the number of kokanee salmon dropped to only 20 fish in 2009, when there really should have been hundreds, if not thousands. So the mysterious part is that we don't really know what happened there. So today, Chief Smith and I are going to talk to you about some of the work that our salmon team is doing to solve this mystery and hopefully help our little kokanee salmon to thrive. The kokanee salmon here in Kalani are special for a lot of reasons, but there's one in particular that stands out. I'm going to give you a hint. It has to do with the water that they live in. So now I'm going to ask you a question and I want you to call it out, okay? Where do you think a salmon lives? Think about it. Where does a salmon live? Did you guess in outer space? No? Okay. Did you guess on your dinner plate? No, probably not. 
did you guess in the ocean? That's right. So mostly, mostly right. Usually salmon spend most of their adult lives in the ocean, but these kokanee are a little bit different. So on the screen, you should see a collection of pictures that show a salmon's life cycle. What makes these kokanee salmon so special is they don't ever leave the lake and streams that they were born in. These co special kokanee salmon never go to the ocean. So the image you see is of a place called Sockeye Lake, Sockeye Creek, and Lake Louise. And outside of the photo is a much larger lake, Matatanaman in Southern Shoshone, or Caffeine Lake in English. The kokanee salmon spends its whole life here, moving between, uh, oh, I lost my mouse, moving between the small creek and the lakes and in and out of Matatanaman. So the arrows there are kind of showing you which stage of the salmon's life and kind of generally which location they like to hang out with. Now, kokanee salmon weren't always locked into this lake system. There's evidence that very, very long ago, a glacier blocked the river that our kokanee ancestors were using to travel to and from the ocean. The salmon that were caught on this side of that glacier couldn't travel to the ocean anymore. So they turned around and they went back into the lake system and they've made it their home ever since. So you remember this graph that we were just talking about? It looks pretty simple, but the truth is it's so much work went into making it. Every single dot that you see represents at least two weeks of land guardians and Parks Canada staff standing knee deep in the water with little clippers, counting all of the spawners they see returning to Sockeye Creek. Do you know what spawners means? Hands up for yeah, hands up for no, hands up for really, I don't know really, good stuff. Uh, so spawners is the word for adult kokanee returning to where they hatch to lay and fertilize their own eggs. Now remember how I said that this graph shows that at one point only 20 spawners were caught where that arrow is pointing? Uh, that told our salmon team that something was definitely happening that was bad news for the kokanee salmon's health. It wasn't really clear what was going on. So this is a picture of Matatana Man from a different angle than the one I was showing you before. So this lake system is much smaller than the entire ocean, but there's still a lot that it could be going on, meaning it hasn't been easy to figure out the problem and making it even harder for us to know how we can help our salmon. So our salmon team of Land Guardians and Parks Canada staff have some theories, and these theories we call hypotheses about what's going on. So a hypothesis is really just a fancy word for a really good guess about something that we kind of already know, but we don't know the whole story. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna list three hypotheses. One of them is sneaky though, and it isn't actually one of our real guesses. So can you help me decide which of our hypotheses or guesses is the one that is not the real one? In a moment, I'm going to ask you to hold up your fingers to show which one you think is not a real hypothesis. I'm going to tell you when it's time, okay? So get your fingers, wiggle them ready, get them ready. So here are our three hypotheses. Do you think the fake one, remember, we're looking for the one that's not real, is number one, something in the water. Salmon eggs and other fish too just need just the right kind of water. Oops. <laughs> uh, need just the right kind of water, the right temperature, the right minerals and not too much stuff floating around to be healthy. So our first hypothesis is there's something in the water of the streams and lakes that's making it hard for the salmon eggs to survive. So remember that one. Or do you think the fake hypothesis is number two? Are there too many salmon being caught by people? In Kluwani, anglers are the people that like to fish. They're not allowed to catch kokanee salmon. And if they do by mistake, they must let them go back into the water. So that means hypothesis number two is are there too many salmon being caught by accident? Now, our final hypothesis, remember, we're looking for the fake one. Is it number three? Big animals like orca or the killer whale love to eat salmon. They go, om nom nom, they eat so much of it. So our hypothesis number three is, are there too many hungry whales in Matatanaman? Okay, so remember, the, <clears throat> excuse me, we want you to show us the number that you think is not the real hypothesis. So I wanna see one finger up if you think it's something in the water, Two fingers up if you think it's too many salmon are being caught, or three thing fingers up if there are too many orca eating kokanee. All right, everybody show me your fingers. What do you think it is? Wonderful. Okay. If you held up three fingers, you're right. Orca do eat salmon, but only the ones that live in the ocean. Kokanee salmon are safe from whales in our freshwater lakes here in Kiwani. Now I'm going to treat, turn it over to Chief Smith, and he's going to share with us all about the Champagne and Ajax First Nations land guardians and their connection with the land. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, again, in Gleo Shokothan, Dunche, ING, Kaf Nukuye, Dana Theada, ING, 
Gitlamet DJ I ING uh, Takini U Ninja. So what I just said to you was that my name is uh, Kachnuch. I am the chief of the Champagne and Jack First Nation. And I uh, I actually sleep just west of, or sorry, east of here uh, in a region about 60 miles away um, in the Takini River Valley. So very close. Um, Champagne and Jack for many, many years uh, has has not been a part of, of any type of study. Um, and so as, as all of you know, um, when, when you have partners uh, doing school projects that, uh, you know, you have one or two that don't really want to be a part of the project, um, the project doesn't, you, other people have to work harder. And so for many years, uh, Champagne Jack people have not been a part of any type of decision making or being a part of any kind of group that uh, can share their opinion as to how the fish um, uh, live and and survive in in the Matatanaman uh, lake system. So for us, we have been pushing really, really hard and, and we're thankful to Parks Canada uh, for them to see that we have a, a lot of people who have a lot of traditional knowledge um, and we have a lot of people who are just as concerned as everybody else about the fish and, and where they're going to. We have a program called the Land Guardians Program, and our Land Guardians are individuals who go out and have a great job. They go out and they look, uh, talk to people, they, they study the, uh, the environment, they study all the animals, um, and they come back with their findings to tell uh, the Champagne government um, how the environment is doing with all the animals. Champagne people um, believe and have always believed that we are part of the whole ecosystem. We are not above it. We are uh, a part of it and we have responsibility to our, uh, um, the four-legged animals, the winged animals, the birds, and, and of course the fish. And, and we have, uh, you know, a, a responsibility to the whole environment to, to carry on and to help um, sustain it because we, of course, as, as the people of the land, uh, need, required all of these, uh, um, the four-legged, the, the the fish, and the winged, the birds, um, to survive in this in this uh, area, and so we have been working uh, more and more every day closer with Parks Canada to try and help them understand where what we know of the fish, and and where they live, how they spawn, their life cycle. Uh, like was said earlier on. Um, that the uh, fish were originally came here as part of a large glacial um, a dam that had dammed up the Alsac and, and Tatch and Chini rivers. And it, it flooded this whole entire area to make a huge lake, um, a lake that would rival um, you know, some of the smaller Great Lakes. And, and that enabled the fish to, to actually stay in the area, um, migrate around a, a large, large hundreds of square kilometer area. And, and when the, the, the glacier retreated and the dam broke, um, it stranded uh, a number of the salmon who traditionally, um, because of the geological uh, features, um, would, would not have actually even been in Kathleen Lake um, or Matatanaman. So uh, we just are, are pleased. We, we continue to work and, and um, we're, we're happy to always share our traditional knowledge, the knowledge that we uh, have uh, been passed down by our ancestors who have lived here for many thousands of years. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. So now I'm going to turn to our next slide. So... Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, while there are no whales, so going back for a couple of minutes, there's no whales in Matatanaman, there are lots of other species that depend on kokanee as a food source. So there are other fish eat kokanee, grizzly bears, black bears, wolves, eagles, other birds, all like to gobble up some salmon if they can catch them. As you can see in this photo, there's a grizzly bear down in the middle there. And that bear we got to watch with our drone footage when we were doing some research, chasing the salmon all around, trying to catch them, trying to catch them. I think we watched them for about 25 minutes and we didn't see them catch a single one. So they got to work pretty hard to be able to catch their food. So because of all these species, depending on the kokanee as a food source, it even increases even more the value of why we're trying to do work to protect them. 
So what is our salmon team in Kluwani doing about all of those hypotheses that we talked about? Well, since 2004, Kluwani National Park and the Land Guardians of Champion and Asia First Nations have asked that anglers do not catch kokanee salmon in Matatanaman. By not catching these kokanee, anglers are helping our team to make sure that as many of them live long lives and return to where they hatch so that they can lay their own eggs and continue this cycle. So that was hypothesis number three and number two, if you remember from a little while ago. But now, do you remember what the first hypothesis was? Call it out if you remember. That's right, so something in the water. So to understand what's in the water of the lakes and creeks that Kokanee live in, our salmon team is trying all sorts of different things. They're taking water samples, which means collecting the temperature of the water and filling tiny little bottles with water at different times of the year, different times of the day even sometimes, to really get a good idea of what might be in there. So these water samples that we take are then sent to other scientists who will help us do all sorts of different tests to find out what tiny bits of soil, minerals, metals, or anything else that might be floating around in that water and to help us. If they tell us what's in there, maybe we can start figuring out what's going wrong. So these photos are some of our team in the water, just like I'd mentioned earlier, knee deep, trying to figure out some of the science behind this. So now, it's a nice day at the side of the lake. I know those pictures make it look like it, but some things, things, sometimes things get very stinky. So to find answers about what might be harming these kokanee, we've got to look in some really interesting places. So spawning or laying and fertilizing their eggs happens at the end of a kokanee salmon's life. After they have carefully covered their eggs in loose gravel to keep them safe throughout the winter, the adult salmon will die. Even a dead kokanee salmon, though, can help us sol solve this mystery. So our salmon team goes out to collect their bodies that, and, oh, sorry, I missed my points. So goes out to collect these carcasses, and by running tests on the otoliths, a bone-like part of their bodies that acts like their ear, everybody find your ear? So it's essentially a fish ear that we're looking at. We can learn so, so, so much. These otoliths tell us what the water was like throughout the Kokanee's entire life. And while we don't have all the answers yet, there's still a lot of tests and lots of science going on in the background. By studying these carcasses, it's gonna help us understand so much more about their lives. So before we end things today, I wanna to say a huge thank you to Chief Smith for joining us and sharing the story of the Kokanee Salmon and the Land Guardians of Champion and Ajax First Nations. And also to you, the students, thank you so much for joining us. And today with your help, We've come just a little bit closer to solving the case of the missing kokanee. Thank you so much. Fantastic, mm -hmm. Rochelle. Chief Smith, thank you so much for that uh, deep dive into the topic today. I love the slide. I love the chance to have you here today as a special guest. Uh, what a special program. We've got a whole bunch of classes live with us. We've got a bunch on YouTube. If you are on YouTube and you want to let us know where you're joining from, share questions in that chat bar. We'd love to hear from you. But we're going to dive in first with a few questions from our live groups today. And so, uh, Miss Pool's class, grade seven, eights joining us in Ontario. If you guys want to kick us off with a question, you are good to go. Hey, guys, welcome in. Hi. Hi. Do you have any questions for us today? Mm, no, not yet. That's okay. See, we did cover a lot. If you think of any, I will come to you. We can go from there. How about our grade four Minto crew today? You guys were so enthusiastic before we got underway. Any questions for our team? Um, well, we were just wondering, what do those fit salmon fish eat in that lake? Oh, that's a great question. Do you want to take that one or should I take that? All right, so the kokanee salmon, they like to eat other little bugs that they can find and other tiny little critters that are floating around in the water with them. So that's usually what they're going for. At different stages of their lives, they're yes, gonna, yes. gonna eat different sizes of bugs as they grow. But a kokanee salmon doesn't get too big. They're about this long when they're adults. Oh, Is that oh, accurate? A little longer. Maybe a little bit longer, yeah. <laughs> but they're not very big. They're not as big as the salmon that you'll see that come out of the ocean. They're quite a bit smaller just because there's not as much food available for them. But they're eating tiny little invertebrates and they go munching those all throughout the lake. That's a great question. Thanks for asking. Great question, great guys. Question. Um, I'm going to go to St. James grade sixes in just a second, but I love this question from YouTube. So Cole and Arthur want to ask uh, Chief Smith, uh, in your language, is there a word for kokanee salmon? Uh, we we have uh, a, a term because they're very close to sockeye salmon. So our, our term for them is sumai. Yeah. Um, so that it's very close to the actual um, English word. Yeah, fantastic. Thanks, guys. Great question, Cole and Arthur. Uh, St. James, let's head to Vernon, BC, grade sixes. If you guys have a question for us, come on in. Uh, yeah. Do they eat specific bugs? 
Ooh, you talked about generic invertebrates, Rochelle, but now we're getting into the specifics. We really want to know. You have to tell us. <laughs> I didn't study that part. Um, I could guess, but I honestly, I couldn't say specifically. They're quite opportunistic. So I would assume that they're going to eat whatever they can find because they're hungry all the time. Our lakes in Yukon are quite a lot, very, very cold. Yeah. And so there's not always as much life as you might see in a lake in Vernon, for example. They're a little bit denser. And so whenever they find food, that's what they got to eat because they don't know when the next chance to have a stack is going to be. Yeah. I love the phrase opportunistic. We actually don't get that in many of our programs. So like if you come across it, you're eating it. sort of like me when I wake up and there's some snacks in the morning. It's like, oh, I'll grab a little bit of that, a little bit of this. Yeah. It makes me happy. Exactly. Uh, actually, I have a full answer now. So my, my friend just behind the computer says that it's zooplankton. And I don't know how to say that. Crinomid. Huh? Chironomid larvae. So I will find a way to save that and share it with folks if they want. I, you can look at my <laughs> I love that. And I love that you have colleagues that know these terms offhand. By the way, I would find yep. that tricky to pronounce too. Um, Miss Wong's class, unmute your mic. Uh, joining us today in the Northwest Territory. So exciting to have a group joining us from there. Uh, if you want to unmute, you are good to go for a question. Hey, grade fives, come on up. Yes. Sprint, sprint. No, you're good. Take your time, guys. No hurry. Hi. <laughs> Hi. 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 Hello. Hello. Oh, you are on camera. I know. Do you have any questions for our team? Yeah. We have one student asking questions. Give us a second. Um, does the male, um, males, uh, like help fertilize the eggs? Or like Ooh. Eggs? Yeah. That's, yeah, for sure. So the female will lay her eggs, and then the male will swim over top and put and fertilize those eggs. And then once the two mix, the eggs will be fertilized, hopefully. And then the female will go back and she'll bury them gently in a bit of gravel to protect them from predators, to protect them from the cold in the summer, or sorry, over the winter time. It'll just give them a little bit of space so that the water is always flowing through and they stay nice and protected. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Um, I love this question from Miss Lawson's class. Welcome in Miss Lawson's class, glad you guys could make it. Brooklyn wants to know from two threes, why the adults die after laying eggs? What's going on? <laughs> Well, I mean, that's part of their circle of life. So they live to be about four or five years old, I think. Um, yeah, four or five years old. And that's just part of their life cycle. They, as a little baby fish, they swim out, they're eating, they're doing their best to survive. They're avoiding predators. They're living life. They're trying to eat as many of those invertebrates that we were just talking about as possible. And once they've been fully matured, they return to where they hatched and they lay their eggs and that's that's just the end of their life that's part of the circle life here so yeah i like thinking too i mean imagine if they stayed in the ocean and laid their eggs there maybe they could do that repeatedly but then their eggs are more likely to be eaten by predators and so you evolve this thing where you end up in a position where your eggs have the best chance of survival they're in that great fresh water they have fewer things trying to eat them necessarily and they're i mean it, it's uh, amazing what natural selection can do when it comes to you know getting different ways of existing in the world so great question guys yeah. Uh, Chief Smith, I want to share a question with you before we dive back in with our live groups. We are whipping through this Q&A. It's like the fastest Q&A of all time. You guys are doing great. So in the, I guess, area region, we, we highlighted this great graph. And by the way, Rochelle, I'll give you credit for a great graph. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Will you, is there an oral history, history tradition of how many salmon there have been there for a long period of time? Like, is there any way of knowing what was happening 100 years ago, 1,000 years ago? Do we have any of that knowledge? through stories? Well, some of our traditional knowledge um, talks about how the fish were a, a steady resource. Um, yeah. it, it provided uh, opportunities for our people. Um, the, the, the other side of the coin, though, is that we didn't really have to rely on the kokanee salmon because, of course, a, a short probably 30 miles away as the crow flies, is is a place where we call uh 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 chu right which is clucks creek and the, the that there has many uh tens of thousands of uh, okay. fish returning so when you're talking a four or five thousand fish um and and a and a ecosystem that is um is not uh completely adept to to uh getting salmon um, and, and catching salmon in an efficient manner, um, you know, go, it's not that far away to, to go to a resource where there's, like I said, last year, I think um, our sockeye return, which was a completely abnormal return, like super high, um, but was traditionally, this was the traditional return. 
of in you know, I think we topped out just over 26,000 sockeye returning to uh, one of one of our um, uh, traditional villages. Uh, and so, yeah, so, you know, we, while I think there was some use of, of the resource, some use of the salmon traditionally, um, for efficiency's sake, it was a lot, um, it was a lot more efficient to just uh, travel to the, the village of Klakshu and have, um, yeah, and have uh, use of that resource. Fantastic. I think that's too, isn't it? Yeah. So and and yeah, the the fish are a lot bigger, and and of course we have not only the sockeye salmon run, we also have the king salmon run. Um, that uh, yeah, chinook salmon. Um, that that also uh, we use quite uh, a bit more actually than the sockeye because they were larger fish, and uh, we use them for preservation um, yeah. mainly. I got to say, it all sounds delicious to me, uh, but certainly uh, not too far ago uh, for bigger fish and more of them sounds like a good plan. Fantastic. Thanks, uh, Chief Smith. Miss Fool's class, if you guys want to come on in and ask a question now, if you're good to go, come on up. Yeah. Can you stand up? Raise your hand so we can see. Okay. You come over here. <laughs> <laughs> and Ms. Will, you can share, if you're nervous to ask, you can share on their behalf too. Let's see, it's coming. Hi. Hi, <laughs> pop down. Pop down a bit. Sit down. There you go. So, uh, how long is, the, sorry, not how long, how good is their memory? How good is their memory? How do they find the areas that they're going, I guess? Uh, do we have any idea about that? Thank you. Sorry, we didn't quite catch, the, catch that question. Could you rephrase it for us? No, we kind of lost internet yeah. for a moment. I think How good is their memory? So, I mean, I guess uh, classically when people think about salmon, they think about coming up like, you know, they're in the ocean and then they come up this like one stream to lay their eggs. So their memory must be really good. Do you have any thought or insight on that? Or is it pure instinct or what's the deal? That's a really great question. So my yeah. understanding is it's less to do with memory and more to do with their sense of smell. Yeah. And they can, yeah. they, they grow, they're in those eggs, they're surrounded by the water where they're being, they're growing in the egg where they hatch. So they know that smell of the area and then they leave. And I, some research says that it might be the smell. There's other theories about how they come back to it. Um, I don't know definitively though. I don't know exactly for sure. So that's a really great question, but I think it's got something to do with those noses. Yeah. And I always like to highlight sure. that. Chief Smith wanted to add something as well. Please. Yeah. Um, so for our people, we believe that we have a relationship with salmon and, and that uh, the salmon, uh, when we first uh, met one another, um, salmon were to us called salmon people. And they, they uh, gave us instruction as to how we were to manage the resource. And they gave us many rules on how we were to handle them, how we were to utilize them, and that there was a, like a promise given between the salmon people and and our people um, that if we that if we lived up to the promises that we gave them that mm -hmm. they would return every year to come and and feed our people so you know for us it's not so much about science but it's about a a long long history and relationship um, that we have with uh, the the salmon and and so they return um, to fulfill their promise to us and how we use them is our promise to them on how uh, we'll respect uh, what they uh, give to us. Yeah, what a beautiful story or way of looking. I think we'd have a lot fewer problems in conservation in the world if everyone had a tradition like that. Uh, that's a, a fantastic message. And I, I like to, so from the, the scientific uh, angle with the, the smell, it sounds so outlandish to think, you know, oh, they find this one river by smell amidst this whole ocean. And I always like to highlight for people, if you're in a crowd of 100,000, you know your mother, you know your friend, you know them by sight. And to an animal that doesn't rely on sight, that sounds ridiculous. How could you possibly find this one individual or one place? But of course, that's so natural to us, so natural to salmon for smell, it's so natural to other animals for hearing. And so I think it's a really neat way of, of looking at the world. Both great answers, guys. That was fantastic. Uh, let's head to our grade four Minto crew, and then we'll take a few from YouTube before wrapping up with our live classes. Minto group, unmute. Come join us. Hi, guys. Uh, we had a question about how can you tell the difference between the male salmon and the female salmon because 
we're we don't have them near us here so they're just wondering how you tell amazing that's a great answer uh jesse would you be able to show the um main page of the the powerpoint again yeah so right, right there? you know you've got um a version of screen share up but not the one with the picture i'll get it up the moment okay. it pops up there you go perfect hang there on okay let me flip through uh from beginning oh hang on i've got a really great picture that will uh, help. uh we believe you yeah oh that's not what i wanted that's pretty too though this is the yeah. thing about your areas it's like it's just stunningly <laughs> beautiful we got bc folks we got yukon and northwest territories you guys are really used to places like this we're all, all right how is that jesse can you see that's that main perfect photo? yeah we got our two different kinds there Okay, great. So I'm going to pull you guys back up so I can see you. So in this photo, there's a male salmon in the back and a female salmon in the front. So I'm going to make this actually your job. Um, I can't remember the name of this teacher that was in this classroom. Um, what differences do you guys see between those two fish? Here, I'm going to bring him back in. I'm mute. We got all the, all the hands are up. What do okay. we see is different? Uh, Hazel, what do you see that's different? <laughs> the male has like a longer jaw profile. Huh? That's right. And he's kind of got that hook on his nose, too. Okay. So um, that's, oh, sorry. Oh, Another. I was just going to say, so the reason they have that hook, that helps the males. They fight each other over who gets to fertilize which eggs. So that's part of the reason they've got that hook beak on there. Cool. So what other do you see? Uh, the female has um, a, like, flat and curved So she, the female has more of a flatter, grayer color, maybe? Yeah, for sure. So there's some differences in color, definitely. I think the males get a little bit stronger red uh, than the females, but it also kind of depends on the fish as well. Okay, Any else? other differences that you guys one see? Yes, Cyprus, one more guess. Um, the female has like has less orange and there's like strips of red and so it's all red. Okay, yeah. color. I like that. Has yeah. Rochelle, what so else is there? There's one more big one, I think. Well, the one that I'm thinking of is the male. So he's got that hooked beak, but his back where his dorsal fin is, is also quite a lot larger. So there's a bit, once they mature and they're ready to spawn, they do get some of those differences. When they, Before they spawn, when they're just adults, they look quite similar to males and females. They don't change too much, but as soon as spawning season starts, they really start to change. And you'll see those changes in the size, in the beak of their, the little nose, um, and their color obviously is a huge difference. Do you want to add anything? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so there you go. That's the answer. All right, really quick. I know Miss Wong's class is like out the door. We'll just say a big farewell to them in Northwest Territories. Hi, Hi. guys. Thank you so much for joining today. I uh, really appreciate you coming in here today. Uh, let's take a couple of questions from YouTube, and then we'll head to our St. James crew in a second. Uh, right. Miss Babbitt's class, and a couple of classes have expressed this on our YouTube chat. Uh, do salmon sleep? Hmm. Okay. <laughs> do salmon sleep? <laughs> With their eyes open. With their eyes open, yeah. Uh, I mean, they must, they rest differently. Aaron, does salmon sleep? All things rest. So yes, they must sleep in some regard. It's just going to look very, very different than how we think of sleeping, right? Because they don't close their eyes. They don't crawl into bed at night. They're always kind of moving around. They got to keep the water moving through their gills so that they can breathe. But they will hide somewhere nice and safe, and that's where they'll have their rest. So yeah. we've actually done many programs with aquaria and on fish around the world. And so there are certain kinds of fish that are able to just lie down on the bottom of the floor and basically go to sleep the way that we would. You see this actually in aquaria in Toronto, around the globe. If you ever get the chance, you'll see some things that just lie on the bottom. The things that have to keep swimming to keep the water going over their gills will sleep and they literally like sleep swim. So some things can classically turn off parts of their brain. We know this with dolphins. They'll swim and turn off. Like some of you might have your brains turned off half the time in classes sometimes as well. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, turn off half your brain. And it's it's basically like a, just a generic swim. They're not moving around. They're not darting. They're doing a very methodical thing. And that allows them to sleep. Great question. I love when we get that. All right, St. James, I'm coming to you in two quick seconds. Uh, Miss Varden's class wants to know, how good is their vision? So we talked about how great the smell is, able to find these rivers. Uh, are they are they good at seeing? What do we think? Yeah, they are. Um, <laughs> our, our, you know, for the bears and everything else that um, uses them as food, they, they are quite uh, tricky to try and catch. And so it takes a lot of uh, skill uh, to be able to even sneak up on a fish. Uh -huh. 
Yeah, I mean, definitely. If a bear was trying to eat me, I'd really want my vision to be really good too, to jump out of the way. I, I think that's sort of a, a classic thing that a lot of our students might have seen is bears catching salmon in rivers uh, around the world, in Canada, the United States. It's one of the most special things in all of nature, so I'm glad that was your example. Um, St. James grade sixes, come on back in, guys. Hey. Hi. Um, how, how old did the salmon get, and what's the oldest salmon you guys know? Yeah. That's a good question. So they live to about four or five years old. So they don't get very old as far as, you know, people terms, but that's their whole life cycle. So they grew, go through all those stages of their lives. And uh, when they're ready to, and they're mature, they return to their, uh, where they do their spawning and then they die. And that's just the circle of life. Um, yeah. I don't know if there's, if we've counted how old the oldest one was. <laughs> Our, our our studies um, traditionally for other species. So uh -huh. um, sockeye uh, and kokanee are very very similar in their DNA structures. So they do run four to five years. Uh, the Chinook salmon um, usually come back to our uh, country uh, sometime. You know the, the the more mature ones come around seven or eight years old. Uh, some younger ones do come up, but yeah, they they usually run a, a little bit older than the sockeye. Yeah. Or okay. Um, guys, time flies when you're having fun. We are nearing the end of the broadcast. I wanted to share just a few more questions to wrap us up. Uh, Chief Smith, what are you wearing around your neck? It's quite fantastic. Oh, this guy. Um, uh, this is what we refer to as the Chief's amulet. Um, so, as the chief, um, some of my citizens were so kind a number of years ago to uh, bead this, sew it together, and present it to me at my birthday. Oh, how, by the way, super nice, but also Chief's Amulet is one of the great names for anything in the world ever. That is a fantastic <laughs> title for that thing. Uh, I mean, anyway, uh, let's uh, take one question from YouTube before we wrap up. It's actually a great question to end with every time. Miss Sadler's class wants to know, how can we help protect salmon? We've got kids today in Northwest Territories, BC, Ontario, Nova Scotia, all across Canada. No matter where you might be joining from, is there a way that we can protect these salmon or, or in general help protect wildlife near us? You want to start? Uh, yeah, um, I think, you know, for, for the, the age group and the students here are um, ask your mom and dad or your parents or your grandmas and grandpas, your aunties and uncles, ask them questions about um, what what's happening in your part of the world that would uh, affect the, the lives of, of not only salmon, but all animals. Um, either the four leggeds the wing creatures or the or the the finned um and just have that conversation um open up that conversation and maybe create some awareness within your own family uh circles amazing yeah, yeah and i would just add figure out what salmon are closest to you or other species in the waters um you might not be near a population of salmon but you're probably near some sort of water and all that water is connected in one way or another. So consider those connections and start small, start learning, learn as much as you can. And then those kind of ideas of solutions and stuff, they'll become apparent. So, and if you ever want to come visit us and see the kokanee, you can stand on the deck and look down in the water and try and spot them. You're most welcome to join us. <laughs> I'm hopping on a plane. I'm leaving the broadcast, yeah. guys. No, yeah. that was it's my favorite answer. We can't work to protect something unless we understand it and we know it and we love it. We want to share that. So the best thing you do, get out, go explore, uh, talk to people in your family. I think that's a really fantastic message. And to both of you, Rochelle, Chief Smith, thank you so much for joining us today. I do want to note for our classes, if you want to keep the learning going, the road trip site is below on the screen. All our programs, including this one, will be up on YouTube forever. So if you want to catch this or share it with your friends, please do. And if you loved what you had the chance to see today, head to the Canadian Geographic Education site, join in the contest, do drawings of kokanee salmon, uh, learn about Kluani. It's a really, really special part of the world. And as you two are new to this program, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our teacher friends to say a big thank you and farewell. So Miss Houle, St. James, Great Four Minto Group, thank you so much for joining today. Have a wonderful day and bye for now, everyone. See you all soon. <laughs>